all for being here. Um, so just to give you a rundown of um, how today's event will go, we'll first hear from Professor Wolf. Um, if you could hold your questions for after this done, we'll have a designated question and answer time. And after that, we'll have a casual reception in the atrium in this very building. Um, if you walk out of this room and turn right, there's a, there's a passage where if you just follow that down, you'll see a nice little garden area that's inside the building, which is warm. And surprisingly, it's here. Um, and that's where we will be for the reception. And so, today we're here to talk about and think about the future of food and the future of food and food systems planning with this impending time, the impact of climate change on all of it. And for some of us, that's something we think about all the time, whether it's food or climate change. But we're really here to think about it together. What, how do we plan for food and food security with knowing that there's this changing climate headed our way. And we're not really sure, or maybe we have some understanding of what that will look like, but what will that look like for what we need to do? And um, so to talk about that, we have uh, Professor Wolf from Cornell University, and I will introduce him in a short while. Um, today's talk is sponsored by the National Institute of uh, Food and Agriculture, and we thank them for the support. And Growing Food Connections, which is the, is the baby of the food systems and healthy communities that, that right now has put this event together. So we can take a moment to think about the future and how we're going to think about food. Um, with that being said, um, there are facilities available for um, men and women down the hall if you so need it. And please feel free to come and go as you need. To introduce Professor Wolf. Um, professor Wolf comes to us today from Cornell University where he is the Professor of Plant and Soil Ecology in the Department of Horticulture. He obtained his academic training at the University of California, Davis, where he focused on vegetable crops for his masters and ecology for his PhD. At Cornell, he teaches climate change and the future of food and coaches the climate change and soil health program work teams. Dr. Wolf is the leading authority on climate change impacts on natural ecosystems and food security. Some of his current projects include new low-cost approaches for soil carbon assessment, new tools and incentives for greenhouse gas accounting and management in agro-ecosystems, new tools for farmers for strategic adaptation to climate change and new biological indicators of soil health. He currently leads a USDA funded project focused on new tools for greenhouse gas management in agroecosystems and contributes to several projects focused on soil conservation and climate change resilience in Ethiopia, Malawi, and Tanzania. Over the course of his academic career, Dr. Wolf has authored a multitude of publications. In, ad in addition to his peer-reviewed articles, he led the agriculture and ecosystem teams for the 2011 New York State Climate Report, and more recently co-authored the Northeast chapter of the 2014 National Climate Assessment. He is also the author of the award-winning popular science book on soil ecology, Tales from the Underground, and Natural History of Subterranean Life. Dr. Wolf's presence in our university and in Western New York community could not come at a better time. Many organizations and individuals in our community are working to strengthening our food system, and many are working to adapt to climate change. Our region is also in the midst of preparing a regional sustainability plan, the One Region Forward Plan led by Dean Shibley, who is here with us today, which intends to guide our region toward a more sustainable future. I am certain that Dr. Wolf's remarks will give us all much to think about for our collective work to strengthen food systems in the face of climate change. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of many of our community partners who have taken the time for being here. And you will all get an opportunity to meet and ask many of your questions in the Q&A and at the reception of food. Without further
further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Wolf to you today. So with this first slide, um, well, I have a clicker here also. We might dim the lights maybe a little bit um, toward the front of the room. There is a, uh, Cornell has a climate change website, pretty easy to remember, climatechange.cornell.edu. It has resources uh, for a wide range of uh, uh, sectors, uh, local communities, as well as uh, uh, farmers, gardeners, uh, policymakers, etc. cetera. Um, and an interesting home page that, that talks about recent weather events and puts them into context with climate change and, and other things. Um, also, there is my, uh, my website uh, if you want to know more about my background. I thought I'd start, I guess I'll come out here to uh, illustrate this first graphic. So I've got a few slides at the beginning to uh, put us all on the same page of background about climate science uh, and where we're, where we're at today, what we know and what we don't know. And one thing I'd like to emphasize to groups is the, is the pace of climate change we're seeing today compared to what we see in the historical paleoclimate record. Because I, I have found that even among my colleagues in ecology and agriculture who are, uh, in general, quite aware of the climate change challenge, um, the pace of uh, change projected for this century um, often surprises some compared to what we've seen in the past. So this, this record, as you can see, goes back, it's a, it's a, the x-axis is very squeezed, right? It goes back almost half a million years, more than 400,000 years. And the black uh, line represents the temperatures up and down. These big dips are ice age, uh, ice age phenomena, which are actually uh, reasonably well understood, uh, really caused by astronomical events. Our Earth shifts its axis, uh, it's, it's tilt to the axis a, a bit, and it's um, swerving around uh, its axis a bit periodically, and this uh, has caused, is kind of the trigger for these ice ages. And then along with these uh, changes in temperature, both causing and sometimes the result of temperature changes are the greenhouse gases, in this case methane, CH4, and CO2. So we've known for a long time this, this relationship between infrared absorbing molecules, these greenhouse gases, methane, uh, CO2, and we'll also talk about nitrous oxide later, their correlation with temperature. Um, I want to point out here, this is 10,000 years ago, way over here. We came out of the last ice age over the course of about a thousand years or more, somewhere between a thousand, fifteen hundred years. Uh, the temperature rose about six to eight degrees centigrade, and we came into this relatively stable warm period of the Holocene. And around then is when crop domestication, agriculture, farming as we know it, um, uh, took off. And so certainly the stability of the climate, the warming of the climate, had a significant amount to do with crop domestication. And what I'm going to show you in some of the slides to follow is how far um, from stability we're leaving uh, in terms of what the, the, the current trajectory uh, we're on today. Um, the next slide I'm going to show you is going to have this CO2 trace repeated. Notice for the past 400,000 years going back and forth between about 180 and 280 parts per million. Uh, it's going to have it on a slightly different uh, y-axis because I have to show you where we're going in terms of what we uh, are seeing in terms of carbon dioxide change. So here we have the same x-axis. There's crop domestication 10,000 years ago, 400,000 year record. Here's the CO2 trace, carbon dioxide going up and down between about 180 and 280 parts per million. And over here we see this red line is what's happened with CO2 since the Industrial Revolution. Actually a large fraction of this to age myself in my own lifetime. Uh, those of us who work in this climate change area, we often uh, age each other by when, what was the CO2 level when you were in grad school? <laughs> so for me it was 330 parts per million, just a little bit above here, and now it's uh, around 400. And what's happened in that time, our global temperatures have indeed, as we might expect when we rise, raise that CO2. Um, we have risen the global temperature almost a degree centigrade, about a degree and a half Fahrenheit. Um, at high latitudes, we see more warming than we see in the global average, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And I'll be showing you several um, 
several slides of impacts on food security and natural ecosystems and managed ecosystems just from this change we've seen today. I mean, you're probably all familiar with much of this, sea level rise, etc., all resulting from this little bit. Uh, but the spooky part, and what I wanted to emphasize with the pace of change, is here's where we're projected to go uh, as we proceed through this century. Uh, so the so-called business as usual fossil fuel emission scenario, and actually some of the latest data suggests we're on a steeper curve than that, if you can believe it, in terms of where we're going. And uh, that, that pace of change is not just a little faster than since the last ice age transition, but somewhere between 10 and 100 times faster than what we saw as we came out of the last ice age. And this could all happen within the next 50 to 100 years. And of course, we all hope that we might move towards a more clean and energy and more efficient system and end up somewhere uh, in, in this vicinity. And then there are uh, the optimists, like my friend uh, Bill McKibben, who want to keep us down towards 350, actually bring this whole curve down. And that's going to take a whole lot of uh, activity by all of us and a lot of political will to do that. But anyway, this is where we're going. This is what we're facing. Um, unless you're uh, quite the optimist, what we realize we have to do is probably adapt to some level of climate change, more than what we've already seen. And at the same time, hope we can slow the pace of climate change or mitigate so we don't end up here and instead end up at least somewhere below here. Of course, it's not just about carbon dioxide. This is that CO2 uh, rise that I just was illustrating in that last thing. In this case, we're looking back just at the last thousand years. And since, since the Industrial Revolution, we see this rise in CO2, but also these other two greenhouse gases that play a major role in the global warming we've seen to date. Uh, methane and nitrous oxide. And all three of these are really fairly re relevant to uh, natural resource uh, resources, soils, and agriculture. All three of these gases really get cycled through our soils. Uh, nitrous oxide, as I'll mention, uh, I'll spend a little bit of time on that um, at the latter part of my presentation, because of all three of these greenhouse gases, nitrous oxide is the one that is most closely and almost uh, entirely associated with food production. Uh, about roughly um, uh, back of the envelope types of estimates we have is about 1% of the nitrogen fertilizer used in food production ends up lost as nitrous oxide as those fertilizers uh, in a sort of really, really a natural process of microbial breakdown in the soil give off some nitrous oxide. So as we've had to produce more food for more people and we're using more nitrogen fertilizer, um, we're accelerating that nitrogen. So all of these are contributing to that warming we've seen. Uh, nitrous oxide is about 300 times more potent on a molecule per molecule basis as CO2 in its global warming potential, as we say. So even trace amounts of this gas um, uh, in the, in the so-called CO2 equivalent uh, metrics that we use uh, contribute quite a bit to global warming. So here's a, rather than go through uh, too many of these climate slides, I just wanted to summarize here um, with these bullets here a number of statements that I think uh, the majority of climate researchers that you would find publishing in the peer-reviewed literature would find agreement on. And I'll be showing you a few slides of some things to follow, some aspects of climate change that we still have um, a lot of uncertainty about. But these things there's very little uncertainty about. Uh, first one I already mentioned, seldom has the pace of change been as rapid as, as it is today and projected for the century. There's more warming at higher latitudes, and there's, we understand to some extent why that's happening. I don't want to take the time right now to go into that, but we can explain that um, later during the uh, uh, discussion period. Glaciers worldwide are melting, particularly because at the higher latitudes where we have a lot of these glaciers, we're seeing more dramatic warming than that average global warming I mentioned before. Sea level rise is warming, no matter Sea level is rising no matter where we measure this. Um, not simply due to the glaciers melting. Uh, actually, the majority of the sea level rise is due to warmer sea temperatures and a phenomenon known as thermal expansion. Basically, as the sea temperatures have warmed with the warming air temperatures, it's affected the sea temperatures. And a lot of our oceans now we're detecting warming all the way down as deep as 75 meters uh, deep into the oceans. And this causes, basically, the water molecules are further apart. And 
that's causing uh, sea level rise, which is having probably the most dramatic effects um, uh, to date in terms of things that we can really sort of feel in terms of what climate change might mean for us. Um, along with the uh, general warming of the planet, there's also increased frequency of certain types of extreme events, particularly heat stress, the number of days when we get extreme heat that might be negatively affect humans or plants or uh, insects or uh, wildlife. And because of the differences in adaptation capacity, the capacity to cope with climate change, um, there's a fair degree of certainty that developing regions uh, will uh, uh, have more challenges and be have a more difficult time dealing with food security in the context of climate change than developed regions. So this last one really showing this sort of inequity we should be talking about. Uh, come back to later. This is just a graphic showing a few different emissions pathways we might go on. Uh, the bottom one here, moving through this century, towards the end of the century, illustrating the temperature rise as sort of the business as usual emission scenario, and then more optimistic scenarios where there's a little less warming. Just wanted to point out, the high latitudes here, that purple color in the business as usual scenario in the high latitudes by the end of the century, seven to eight degrees uh, temperature warming by the end of the century. Again, this is what the kind of the magnitude of change we've seen happen as we've gone back and forth in and out of ice ages over the course of 1,000 to 2,000 years, uh, happening in 50 to 100 years. So a lot of, uh, a lot of um, things that are noticed, of course, uh, affecting different parts of the globe differently, but nowhere is it projected to cool down. Um, this is a graphic showing the water story, uh, the projected water story with the orange areas indicating areas where there could be as much as 30% reductions in annual rainfall. The blue area is places where there could be some uh, minor to modest increases in annual rainfall. But before I go into what the implications are of uh, this climate change issue on water and future food security. Let me just make a few comments about even if we didn't have climate change, what we're up against in terms of hoping to feed the world in the future. And uh, this may be quite familiar statistics to some of you, but we currently have a population of about 7 billion and we expect to get up to 9 or 10 billion as we move through the century. But on top of that, and probably you know, has with even more impact, is we expect uh, that the per capita GDP uh, likely to triple in, the, in this uh, century. I mean, and that's a good thing. That's the standard of living basically uh, going up worldwide as many developing countries moved into the developed category. But of all of this taken together, the population increase and the per capita GDP going up is expected to double requirement for food production compared to what we have today. And we don't have double the land resources uh, to meet that demand. And we don't have double the water availability to meet that demand, even before we look at the severe reductions in annual rainfall we're seeing from parts of the world. So climate change puts a severe uh, constraint on our capacity for meeting that, uh, that challenge in the future. We pretty much need to think of everything we have uh, in our power in terms of the entire food system to try to cope, cope with this challenge. Um, it's not just too little water, but also too much water. And in fact, um, in much of the northern hemisphere, a phenomenon that already historically has been pretty well documented, you can see this is a uh, database on the last half century of uh, rainfall data for the U.S. So this is not a a model projection, this is actually what the weather stations tell us. In the Northeast, we've had a 74% increase in the frequency of heavy rainfall events. This isn't saying an increase in total rainfall, it's saying the number of, the, the more of the rain, more of the rainfall we get is coming packaged in heavy rainfall events. Uh, in the case of the Northeast, this is the metric we use is about two inches of water in a 48 hour period. So the number of days where we're seeing that kind of Rainfall intensity is increasing. This leads to flooding, which of course can cause crop damage directly, but also more importantly in terms of food production can mean things like farmers can't get out of the fields, 
to do planting, harvesting, etc. Um, when they need to. This phenomenon is reasonably well understood. Uh, with a warmer planet, we have more soil evaporation. We have more transpiration from the vegetation. And so there's more water vapor in the atmosphere. So when there is an upper atmosphere cooling event that causes rain, there's more up there that come down. This can actually lead to more short-term droughts. If you have the same amount of rainfall occurring in an area annually, but it's coming packaged in a few very heavy rainfall events, obviously you can have greater intervals between uh, rainfall and more short-term droughts. And on top of that, in higher latitude regions like where we are here, um, we're anticipating a longer growing season with climate change, which has its silver lining in terms of crop production. A longer frost week period means new crops farmers might be able to grow. But it also means that crop water demand will increase as farmers move to longer growing season varieties. And in our natural landscapes, plants will be uh, putting out their leaves earlier in the spring and be out there sucking up water from the soils longer. So unless we have enough increase in rainfall, annual rainfall, to keep up with this increase vegetation water demand, we can have both drought and flooding in a place like the Northeast. In fact, both of those are projected for our region. Another phenomenon that's particularly pronounced in mid to high latitude regions like ours is that historically, um, a lot of insect pests, uh, crop pests, weeds, and also insects that are vectors of human disease, such as mosquitoes, etc. Um, get killed back in our cold winters. But we're seeing less of that with warmer winter phenomena. And for example here, this is the little critter named the, uh, the flea beetle. It uh, doesn't do a lot of direct damage to uh, crops normally, except for young transplants. But it does carry a very deadly virus of corn called Stewart's Wilt. And it used to pretty much get knocked back uh, almost every winter in our region, but now it's not. So we're seeing more Stewart's Wilt in our cornfields in this region. Uh, the mountain pine beetle, some of you may have heard of the damage this has been causing to lodgepole pine forests in the western U.S. And it's a beneficiary of climate change that's uh, leading to damage to our natural landscapes. I don't know if this invasive plant is familiar to any of you that might have been in the south. Kudzu, a very notorious invasive weed that's typically been constrained south of here uh, because uh, winter temperatures below about minus 4 degrees will, will kill it off. But um, we, some years ago, actually looking at climate models for our region, predicted that it would be creeping its way up here. And in fact, now because it has been found in North America. And you might think about adaptation to climate change and farmers adapting to this phenomenon. More weed disease and insect pressure, more changes in habitable zones, uh, species that were south of here now coming up. And you might think for a moment about how would a farmer, or a home gardener for that matter, possibly respond? And some of you may be thinking more chemical inputs, more chemical pesticides to control these things. And in fact, that is a very likely scenario. So one of the issues of climate change is these unintended consequences of adaptation. So while one sector of our society adapts to climate change, it may have some unintended consequences, such as more chemicals into our waterways, and it's one of the very complicated uh, policy issues we have to start thinking about dealing with. Um, so getting into a couple things that we have much less certainty about, um, and what I want to emphasize here is simply that it's, it's not just that it's getting a little warmer every year, and we can expect it to get maybe a few more days of heat stress every year, maybe a couple more days of dry conditions every year. But if our climate system is really getting into a more erratic uh, phase, and a lot of things are happening, and it's unclear even to the climate scientists whether some of the variability we're seeing in our climate is really part and parcel of climate change or just part of the normal background noise of normal weather variability. One of them is um, winter variability. And I didn't expect when I got into this 20 years ago that one of the farmer groups that has called me out more often than others to talk about climate change is our fruit growers in this part of the country. But not to talk about heat stress, but to talk about cold damage. And they're pretty concerned about it. And for example, apples uh, in 2012 bloomed four weeks earlier than 
than the historical average. I uh, broke all the record books in terms of earliness of spring bloom. And of course, they were exposed then to four weeks of frost risk. And indeed, uh, we lost millions of dollars in the state for our economy due to severe frost damage to apples, but usually second or third of the US in apple production. And a very serious problem. My own uh, group is we have an apple growth model that predicts when it blooms based on climate data. Um, and we have climate scenarios that we're getting from climate scientists colleagues. And we're trying to determine whether this is something we really need to fear as happening more often, or as the climate changes, we will continue to get some frost events, but at the same frequency uh, of occurrence as in the past. And we don't have the answer yet. So when my apple growers ask me, is this uh, part of climate change? We don't know. Uh, it was awfully cold here last winter, you may have uh, remembered. And you may think about a climate change talk, and what do we say about the cold last winter? Well, uh, this is another thing which we, uh, there's a great deal of uncertainty about. A lot of uh, research going on now among the climate scientists community to determine what, whether what we saw last winter was simply a peak back into the old normal, peak back to what the cold winters used to be like, or actually a new kind of cold winter uh, that's associated with climate change. And before last winter, there was a climate scientist at Rutgers who published a paper uh, that actually predicted the kinds of winter we saw last year. And so did a colleague of mine, Chef Green uh, at Cornell, um, there's a paper here, uh, easy one to get your hands on. December 2012, uh, Scientific American, that issue, The Winters of Our Discontent. Basically what these climate scientists are suggesting, and again, uh, there's not agreement among all the climate scientists that this is happening. But what they are suggesting is that as the Arctic has been warming, more than the equator has been warming, it has reduced the temperature differential between the Arctic and the equator. And that temperature differential is what has held the polar vortex, the infamous uh, now polar vortex, cold winds, tightly to the North Pole. But as that temperature differential decreases, uh, that polar vortex is able to basically kind of slip down and affect our jet stream patterns and uh, uh, cause this, this kind of phenomenon. Uh, so just another area of what we don't know. In any case, um, what we have seen, and where I really feel like, you know, after working up in this area for a couple of decades, I feel like we have crossed a certain threshold which is unfortunate on the one hand, on the other hand, positive in that I've seen some change among the business community, among farmers, uh, and the general populace in terms of um, thinking about climate change. And it's that we've had some extreme events that have, have really, uh, we can really see the impact of. Uh, a classic example, and particularly in our wee part of the world, is Superstorm Sandy. Now there's not certainty among the climate scientists about the relationship between climate change and the frequency of hurricanes. But there is a total consensus almost about sea level rise, right? No climate scientist that I know would disagree that global warming has caused sea level rise. And th in that case, any given coastal storm is likely to have significantly more coastal intrusion and do more damage. So most climate scientists would agree that part of the damage, the superstorm Sandy damage is much greater than it would have been if it was not for climate change and sea level rise. Forest fires and some um, record-breaking droughts and flooding events we've seen also are at least exacerbated by climate change. And taxpayers feel this. I mean, the infrastructure repair costs for something like superstorm Sandy are significant. So we're beginning to see the cost of, as I have in the slide, they're doing nothing. And this is uh, really, what I see now is the business community really beginning to think we've got to plan and cope with this. And the business community really leading the, the beltway, the political leaders, uh, towards moving beyond the debate about whether climate change is happening or not, and onto what do we do to begin to think about coping with some of these things. It also makes us think about, we're all interested in economic development, sustainable development economic development projects, and also using our tax dollars wisely. It's more money for education, et cetera. But the more we're paying for climate change infrastructure repair, uh, 
conversion of tax dollars, basically, to climate change impacts um, is really uh, uh, causing some, some people to rethink uh, you know, this whole issue and how we can really divert some of our best efforts at development in all parts of the world. I want to talk specifically about the farmer audience, uh, because I think they're actually pretty typical of much of the business community, because we also, at Cornell, we get various people from various uh, types of businesses coming and talking to us about climate change and, and what it's going to be. So I've got a few statements here that I think uh, illustrate where I think they're coming from. The first one is, I've been working with farmers actually since my graduate school, school days, 30 years or more. I've never yet met a farmer in the US or in East Africa or Indonesia, anywhere. And I've never met a farmer who's not concerned about extreme weather events and unpredictable weather. And so that's really where we begin the conversation with farmers uh, before we get into the whole phenomenon of climate change, which as you all know is very politically charged. And what farmers say that they're feeling is, again, if they thought it was simple as it's getting warmer, and I have to plan for a little more heat stress every year, they could plan around that. But what we hear farmers actually saying is, what we're seeing on our farm is that, whereas it might have been in the past, once every 10 or 20 years something happened on our farm that we had never seen before in terms of an extreme weather event, now it's once every two or three years, and every year it's something different. One year it's high temperatures in August, the next year it's the wettest spring we've ever seen, all of these things uh, affecting us. So it makes it uh, very difficult to plan around that sort of thing. So in terms of planning, climate change is not so simple as just planning for a little gradual warming. It's becoming this kind of unpredictability. So farmers are diversifying, is what they're doing, hedging their bets. For example, I know a farmer who um, tells this story of for two generations before him, they always drew 90 to 95 day corn. That's corn, that's how long it takes for the corn to mature. Um, and he heard one of my talks several years ago about a longer growing season happening in our area. So he started experimenting with longer growing season varieties uh, because these varieties will yield more throughout the field longer. And indeed that worked for a couple of years, but then he had a year where it was a very long growing season in terms of frost treat period, but it rained so long into the spring and early summer that it was their shortest growing season ever. They couldn't plan it. And so, make a long story short, now he grows 65 day to 120 day corn, whereas for two generations before him, they grew 90 to 95 day corn. So that's, that's how we kind of see farmers respond. The second issue I have here is, this is even hard for climate scientists. Detecting the climate change trend against the background noise of normal weather variability. So, Yes, maybe it's been dry on my farm for a couple of summers in a row, or maybe it's been wet for a couple of summers in a row. But is that really, does that really warrant an investment of $10,000, $20,000, $50,000 for me to put, it, put an irrigation system or a drainage system on it? And this is where universities and uh, government agencies can really play a role, doing the best that we can. It's not perfect, but doing the best that we can in providing. And finally, on the mitigation end, so this is not about coping with climate change, but now I'm talking about how can the agriculture sector reduce its carbon footprint and all of that. Um, again, I can't think of a farmer yet that I've met uh, who is not concerned about energy costs on their farm. Uh, farmers decades ago moved to diesel engines for most of their equipment. Uh, nothing to do with climate change, but to save money. They're more energy efficient. So farmers are very interested in that. They're very interested in renewables on their farm, use of renewable energy sources to, be, to improve their bottom line. And that's where we engage farmers on the mitigation uh, story. But there's another little piece to this that we can't forget. Farmers are also very concerned about climate change policies and how those might affect their bottom line. So when you talk to a farmer about a carbon tax, or you talk to business people about a carbon tax, that it could increase their cost of fossil fuels to run their operation, uh, they get their guard up. And so uh, I don't have some solution here. I'm simply saying this is where much of our business community comes from on the climate change uh, angle. <coughs> OK, 
Okay, in terms of coping with climate change, um, I'm not going to go through these in a lot of detail because I do want to stick to my time. Um, but if you look through this list, uh, even those of you who don't work much in agriculture, maybe even never been on a farm, uh, it's pretty straightforward stuff. It's not like rocket science. You might think about some new varieties that are more tolerant to some of the stresses that you feel you're uh, encountering on your farm. Um, you might change the planting dates if springs are getting earlier. Why not plant a little earlier and uh, take advantage of that so you can get maybe double crop or get a higher yield. I mentioned the diversification of cropping systems at both the farm and the regional scales. And actually that particular one you know, also has implications for in um, uh, many parts of the world, there's really not good access to a wide supply of food diet options. And uh, diversification in terms of food, increasing the number of fruits and vegetables in the diet would do a lot to do to um, address our nutrient deficiencies. So this whole idea of diversifying as a strategy for coping with climate change can also help us address um, this issue we're, we're challenged with, we're really thinking about a new green revolution that doesn't just think about supplying the calorie needs of uh, people, but also um, fruits and vegetables in the diet. Um, new strategies for new pests, um, improving soil resilience to drought, and I've got a couple uh, slides later that we'll talk about this in a little more detail, but as was mentioned at Cornell, another hat I wear is I'm chair, co-chair of this soil health program work team. And what that's really been about is nothing to do initially with climate change. It's really focused on improving uh, farm soils for crop production, for farm yields, and uh, building up organic matter or maintaining organic matter in the soils. Very good for crops, crop nutrition. Good for the farmer. Uh, but at the same time, those soils that where we maintain high organic matter have better water holding capacity, and they also have better drainage. So this buffers you from um, uh, both drought and flooding. So uh, that's part of the strategy. Uh, but that can't accomplish it all. If you have really severe uh, uh, drought or flooding events, you really got to think about capital investments and things like irrigation or drainage systems. And this is where a farmer's really got to make a tough decision. Uh, do I actually go to the bank and take out a loan? Fruit crop frost protection in our area is a particular issue. Also an issue of, of considerable concern in our area is the dairy industry that dominates our agricultural economy. It turns out, I'm not an animal scientist, but I've worked with them on this climate change issue, uh, colleagues at Cornell. Uh, cows really like to cool. 40 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit is the ideal temperature for milk production uh, by cows. And heat stress can really reduce milk production. So, a lot of our dairy farmers are going to think about, are going to have to think about retrofitting their dairy barns with better food capacity and food production. So uh, again, so the the uh, the solutions, the adaptations that a farmer might make are not rocket science, but the trick for them is these adaptations are not cost or risk free. So they really need. Um, better information to determine is this normal bad weather or really a climate change phenomenon that warrants an investment? Uh, and then what exactly do I invest in and how soon should I make that investment? At Cornell we have a new uh, Institute for Climate Change and Agriculture that's really all about building decision tools for farmers for just that sort of thing. Uh, it's not just Cornell or uh, other land-grant universities or other universities thinking about providing decision tools for farmers or business leaders, but uh, companies are getting into this as well. Uh, there's a company that really uh, I visited, uh, they're up in uh, called the Climate Corporation. Uh, came out of actually Google, a lot of Google geek types uh, put this together, realizing that businesses, and in particular agriculture, farmers, are going to need weather and climate data like they never have before in order to cope with some of these things. Um, when I went to visit them just about a year or so ago, uh, they really, they had gotten into some crop insurance work, but really were barely uh, phasing some of this in, really had not really made a lot of profit yet. Monsanto just bought them out for a billion dollars. So I think that just illustrates, I say that to illustrate that there is, a, in, you know, companies are recognizing 
that farmers are uh, no longer debating whether climate change is real or not. They're really trying to uh, cope with it. One concern we have, it gets into the sociological aspects of climate change, which are huge, um, is the financial barriers to adaptation. So there's a lot of reasons why someone might not adapt to climate change. One is they might not have the information. They might be getting misinformation. Uh, they might belong to a cultural group uh, which uh, uh, leads them astray, you might say, and leads them away from uh, uh, looking at the issue seriously. But a big one, maybe the biggest one, is financial barriers. So a farmer may know that if I just had $10,000, I could make this kind of change to my operation, and I, then I could probably cope with whatever with what the climate scientists are telling me is going to cut my way in the next 10 or 20 years. They go to the bank and they can't get the loan. So that's, that's a, big, a big issue. And this gets us into the global inequities. Um, in developing countries, this is simply something that we see but writ large in terms of many of the developing nations. The farmers don't have the information sources. They don't have the support system. Uh, they don't have, um, and they don't have the capital to make strategic and so the haves and have-nots are some of the places where we see the greatest population growth and the poorest food security are likely to be hardest hit by just what climate change is going to bring and then they have the least capacity uh, to adapt. Some approaches to dealing with these constraints to adaptation are, of course, uh, again, many of them straightforward, but really implementing them is another story but providing financial assistance to farmers to adapt. Uh, so low-cost loans for adaptation investments. Um, land use and climate change policies that integrate the economic, environmental, and equity issues uh, together into one package. Uh, new decision tools, as I mentioned, such as those we're working on at Cornell, and also companies we're actually working on for farmers. Better just weather, uh, risk delivery information, better pest monitoring so farmers have a heads up on what's coming their way. Crop insurance programs, that's a tricky one. Um, we don't want farmers simply relying on crop insurance to bail them out year after year as the climate's changing in their area when they should be maybe shifting to a new crop or whatever. So you can't, we need a safety net. At the same time, we really want to move and incentivize adaptation rather than simply going to crop insurance programs on year after year. And then the last one I have here is developing new varieties of uh, breeding and biotechnology. Um, uh, and this is seen by some as a, uh, uh, you know, a, a solution to much of our climate change problem. And in my next slide, I'll talk a little bit about this and give you my take on it. I think um, breeding and biotechnology is we need everything at the table to try to cope with this, but I don't think it's really the panacea. I was just at a... Uh, Food security conference, and there were a lot of uh, talk, a lot of talk, of course, about biotechnology. And one of the biggest issues brought up is that, well, there's these policies out there about GMOs, genetically modified organisms, that really constrain our use of the latest and greatest capacity we have of manipulating genes to cope with some of these stresses we might see. Um, and uh, I guess I'm going to just sidestep that. That, that big debate about what should be policies, what do we think about the safety of GMOs, I can give you my take in discussion uh, later. But even given um, what I wanted to point out here in particular is that even if we have more lenient policies and regulations, uh, there's still a number of reasons why uh, genetic engineering or traditional plant breeding, why they're not likely to, uh, you know, very quickly and easily save us from climate change. Most of the success with biotechnology to date has been looking at genetically modifying plants with one or two genes that have very direct effects for a particular insect resistance, resistance to an herbicide, um, et cetera. But environmental stresses like drought stress involve, well, with drought stress, it's, it's um, uh, you know, a couple of papers have talked about probably 300 to 500 genes, even at one growth stage of the plant. An entire suite of genes involved in drought stress tolerance. 
And again, we can go into some of the details of that. If we have questions later about the physiology of drought stress tolerance, a lot of what you might do to um, create a drought stress tolerant variety also might constrain its potential yield in good years. Um, but with the unpredictability of climate change, we'd have to have in, in our plants multiple suites of genes um, because we're not going to know whether the drought would come early in the season or late in the season. It would be a completely different suite of genes uh, at any of those stages. So um, this uh, biotechnology and traditional breeding, I think, are important and uh, essential, actually, to helping us cope with climate change, but not going to be solved uh, right away. And then we have the sociological issue and the social issue of farmer access to the products of biotechnology in particular very expensive to explore these options, and then the seed's expensive, making it not available to farmers unless we get more uh, public dollars into uh, that. And if it's more expensive for the farmer, then it gets more expensive for the consumer, and affects food prices and, and human nutrition. So look at that whole food system uh, right there. Okay. So, um, now I'm gonna kind of change gears a little bit much of what I, the last several slides were kind of talking about, the word I use is adaptation in my, when I say adaptation, I mean coping with inevitable climate change, maybe even taking advantage of some climate change phenomenon. Longer growing seasons, we could look at new varieties and new crop options for a place like the moon. But now I'm gonna to switch to the mitigation end of agriculture. So how do we reduce the carbon footprint of uh, uh, agriculture? And here, as I said uh, earlier, uh, farmers are really all about renewables. I mean, they, uh, here we've got a farmer on some uh, marginal land having a, a wind turbine. Uh, this, if, if, if there's a way for them to be able to afford that, and if, as it's amortized, it makes economic sense for them, um, they have, you know, no farmers are resisting that. Farmers are actually very enthusiastic about these, these sorts of options. So I think, you know, one thing we need are policies that make it possible for farmers instead of constraining our farmers exploring these that actually facilitate farmers getting more and more into renewables. Um, what about biofuel crops and biomass crops? This is another one that's kind of gets into some controversial areas, and let me give you my take on the biofuel crops. Um, so on a theoretical basis, I'm very much in favor of exploring biofuel crop options from this standpoint. Um, compared to taking carbon that's buried deep in the earth as fossil fuels, bringing it up to the surface, and then burning it for our energy needs, and now that carbon that was deep in the earth is now part of our climate system for hundreds of years to come, affecting our climate. It makes much more sense to use plants that take up, suck up CO2 that's already in our atmosphere, and then we burn those, or use those in a certain way to drive our energy. And the CO2, yes, it releases CO2 just like fossil fuels, but it's part of, it's all just part of the same surface cycle. So from that standpoint, there's, there's good reason why there's been interest in biofuel crops. The two areas where there uh, can be some serious problems is first of all, if we're using food crops as our biofuel crops, then that can of course affect food prices. And then we're talking about food for people to eat versus energy. So that's a big challenge. So moving away, none of these actually depict uh, using food crops. Uh, corn, uh, for ethanol is an example of a food crop. Um, the other thing is how you grow it. So what you grow and how you grow it. And it just seems like a no-brainer to me if you're growing a biofuel crop for the reasons I described, but you use a lot of fossil fuel energy to grow it, because you put on a lot of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer that requires a lot of energy, you drive tractors like crazy, a lot of inputs that have a lot of energy embedded in them that makes no, no sense at all. So, uh, but but there's, a, there's again, you know, I feel a role for this. We need everything um, at our disposal on certain land areas, certain types of non-food crops. I'm very interested in supporting this. When it comes to mitigation and agriculture, um, one thing I want to make sure you all recognize, uh, some of you may be aware of this, but in the developed agriculture, uh, intensive agriculture like you see in the U.S. and Europe, etc. Um, it's not about, this is for the U.S., and this is the contribution on a CO2 equivalent basis of 
how agriculture is contributing to global warming. Uh, and you'll notice it's not about CO2 emissions from driving the tractor off the farm. The big story is nitrous oxide emissions and nitrogen fertilizer use. There's also the methane, uh, ruminant animals, uh, the expansion of animal production, particularly ruminant animals, that have in their guts these anaerobic methanogen bacteria that release methane. Also the expansion of rice paddies, um, which is anaerobic wet soils, will also uh, contribute somewhat to this. But you can see the big story is nitrous oxide emissions. So we've already had incentives in agriculture to reduce um, and be more conservative and careful about our nitrogen fertilizer use because of another uh, uh, chemical um, uh, form of nitrogen, nitrates, which can get into our waterways and cause water pollution. And this is simply another incentive to be conservative about our nitrogen use. At Cornell, we've uh, developed, uh, a colleague of mine, Harold Van Ness, and uh, uh, others, I've been somewhat involved in some of this, has, have developed a new a nitrogen management system that uses real-time weather data. It's, an, it's been actually commercialized now. It's a mobile app that farmers can use. And it takes into account real-time weather it takes into account the amount of nitrogen farmers might get, quote, for free from the soil without having to add synthetic nitrogen fertilizers. Anyway, it's a, it's a kind of using new technology to reduce nitrogen inputs and yet not really uh, sacrifice in terms of yields. So that's uh, one angle to this. Another is simply thinking about legumes in rotation. Legume crops um, are crops that actually fix nitrogen of the bacterial symbiosis they have in their roots, provide energy, uh, nitrogen uh, from the air, and uh, it's a way of getting um, nitrogen into a farming system without having to go out and buy synthetic nitrogen fertilizers, which are very energy intensive to manufacture. And finally, I'm not sure if you can recognize this, this picture. Um, I don't know what you see when you look at that, but I see carbon, nitrogen, and energy. Um, we talked to our students about the last century we did quite a job on decoupling crop and animal production systems uh, for reasons of scale of production, economies of scale. And now it's their challenge to figure out how to recouple them, but without you know, imposing major sacrifices on, the, on, the, on farmers in terms of their, their profitability. Just to come back to the soil and soil health management thing, I already kind of mentioned some of this, but this is something farmers are doing and looking at and interested in anyway in terms of crop production. But building soil organic matter in the soils is not only good for crop production, but also part of an adaptation strategy because it increases resilience to ground flooding and part of the mitigation story because organic matter is mostly carbon that otherwise would be in the air as CO2 greenhouse gas. So it's kind of one of these win-win-win stories of um, conservation agriculture uh, being part of the solution. Okay, um, I said nitrous oxide was the big story in the developed world and greenhouse gas emissions. If we look to the developing world, uh, it's not about N2O because they can't afford nitrogen fertilizers most of them and they're not using most nitrogen fertilizer. The big issue really is CO2 emissions due to deforestation uh, slash and burn agriculture, not maintaining soils in good enough condition long enough so we have to keep expanding uh, the area of agriculture, which means cutting down trees. Those trees have huge, are huge storehouses of carbon. And when they're either burned or decomposed, that carbon goes back up in the air as CO2. And as you can see, it's not a small part of the global problem of uh, uh, climate warming. So that's the big challenge. Uh, with the developing world is really uh, uh, maintaining good sustainable soils, reducing um, deforestation. One um, success story, uh, it's still in progress, maybe I shouldn't say complete success, but something I felt um, some satisfaction being a small part of, is a uh, co-op of about 20,000 small landholder farmers in Zambia who um, were pulled together um, in, in, uh, by a variety of forces pulled them together uh, to up their, to improve their food security 
by developing and using more conservation approaches to agriculture to maintain their soils. Um, and you can see their, their, uh, their whole motto is all about protecting soils and also protecting trees. They've begun planting intercropping into their cropland nitrogen fixing trees, um, which are very beneficial in terms of providing the nitrogen fertilizer their crops need, but also the trees themselves store carbon now uh, as part of the solution. This is a Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences paper that summarizes that. Actually, if you go to just itswild.org, you can find out more about this uh, really kind of a cool system. So these kinds of uh, approaches are good for good for food security, but also uh, play play a role uh, in climate change mitigation in these areas. And again, uh, a different kind of take on the link between climate change and sustainable development. Here I'm saying that sustainable agriculture practices, conservation agriculture, uh, is linked to climate change because it's not only good for crop production, but reduces greenhouse gases, sequesters carbon, and makes soils and crops more resilient to climate change. I really barely touched on the food system. I mean, most of my work has focused on the growing and harvesting uh, uh, aspect food system. But of course, there is a whole food system. Along this whole food system, there's a huge amount of waste. And that's a big, big issue with um, looking at food systems and climate change mitigation is bringing some of the waste at various pathways here and recycling that, uh, making something out of it. And then um, we can't forget all of you sitting there, myself, we all are part of the food system consuming. Um, this shows some, an interesting study, um, really excellent study, came out in 2009. I've, there's been a couple since then, but I haven't seen anything that illustrates some of this as clearly as this one, but how the human diet globally, how shifts in the human diet um, uh, could affect uh, climate change. So here we're looking, uh, I'm not showing all the data from the paper, I've got the paper referenced here, but uh, looking at the future, 2050, they have a reference scenario uh, looking at the population growth anticipated, the GDP per capita increase expected, the amount of crop land that would be required, the amount of agricultural grassland for ruminant animals and other grazers, and the annual greenhouse gas emissions. And this is assuming uh, dietary choices that um, follow along the trajectory that the developed world has followed, with as GDP goes up, meat consumption goes up. Uh, this shows the same scenario, 20, I would say 2050, but a simple low meat diet, nothing even really close to a vegetarian diet. This diet includes, allows for as much as twice per week having pork or beef, uh, a couple other times, you know, having poultry, fish, etc. So it's nothing like a vegetarian diet, but even just going to a lower meat diet dramatically reduces the amount of agricultural grassland required and reduces by 30% gas emissions. And now I'm, a, you know, truth be said, I've been vegetarian for a couple of years here and there, but I'm kind of call myself a vegetarian wannabe. But I'm very much in this, I find this very easy uh, to do. And I have colleagues in uh, places like China that I work with, and you know what we talk about, and I talk about with them, is as a country like China moves upscale in terms of their middle class moving up, instead of going to a very heavy meat-laden diet, uh, perhaps leapfrogging where we've been and moving towards this diet could do a whole lot um, to reduce uh, future greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see the more real vegetarian diets, including even no animal products at all, no dairy, can actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 60%. Uh, so um, there's a lot that we as consumers uh, can do. We have a lot of impact in terms of what supermarkets do, farmers do, and just a few suggestions, a healthy diet with less meat, food sources using sustainable and climate smart practices, that means paying attention to where your supermarket's getting your food, or going to the farmer's market, finding out what your farmer's doing, what you're buying from. Local foods in season is the important phrase here. I mean, local foods can be actually much more energy intensive, of course, if you're trying to grow warm season crops in the middle of winter in Buffalo. So we want to think about in-season foods. And then, of course, 
Uh, we ourselves and our homes can do quite a bit to reduce waste, recycle, um, uh, compost, etc. And we do run into this challenge as we eat more fruits and vegetables in our diet, a healthier diet. Uh, those don't store as well as grains and rice and wheat. And that's one of the challenges we have, I think, actually worldwide in terms of moving towards a new green revolution with healthier diets is that we end up with needing an infrastructure to store fresh foods and vegetables um, to maintain the diet. So kind of going back to that whole, some of those food system challenges. But uh, with that, I will stop. That is my last slide. And uh, thanks for your attention. I'll take some questions. Culture, you know, think about just expanding that um, writ large. Um, there's, I think, you know, I think my, my take on that is I, I, I'd like to have everything that's possible in our portfolio to get it out on the table, have uh, people from with a, uh, experts with a wide variety of perspectives and community people with a wide variety of perspectives at the table to discuss these options and let's look at it. And that sounds like um, I'm not sure if it doesn't sound, is that like spam or, <laughs> I don't know. So far, yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, you know, besides the, uh, the key factor, uh, it sounds like actually uh, something that we, we should be considering. But as far as you know, it hasn't come up yet. It's not a university research issue, it's an entrepreneurial issue. Yeah. No, there's no campus research research now. No, not that I know of, no, not that I know of. And at this, uh, I'm trying to think of who was bringing up this. We had a number of industry people. It was some of the people like from Mars and Nestle, these kind of processing companies that were you know, brought up this issue. Yes? Uh, would you mind backing up one slide and let us get your source of information on the human diet impacts yeah, yeah. at the bottom there? Thank you. Yeah, so it's a paper out of the Netherlands, the Netherlands team uh, in the Journal of Climate Change. So just for information, we will make this video available for people to see. Thank you. Yeah, my slides too, I can send as a PDF so someone can put these things up. Get back to the green. Uh, I'm John Atkinson, environmental engineer in here in the league. You talked about warming associated with N2O emissions from fertilizer. Yes. Um, I'm wondering about an order of magnitude difference between that and cooling that might be associated with particles formed from ammonia. Yeah. yeah, so there is the, the whole, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's human activities that also can cause cooling effects. Aerosols, including uh, ammonia, is, is one of them. And um, it, it does have a cooling effect, and ammonia volatilization is something that people are measuring and monitoring. And uh, there are some graphics I have in my arsenal that show the relative magnitude of the cooling, you know, that, that cooling effect relative to the warming effect of the other activities, human activities, and the, the warming effects we have are much greater than those aerosol effects. So but, they're, but, not, but, they're, but they're there, and it reduces the net impact. But specifically as it relates to fertilizer, because more fertilizer also mean more ammonia emissions. Yeah. So I guess how are N2O emissions relative to any screen yeah. emissions from fertilizer? Yeah, well, I think the, the N2O emissions are uh, much more potent because of, because they're, they're 300 times more potent, as I said, on a molecule for molecule basis than, than CO2, whereas um, something like aerosol production from associated ammonia uh, uh, volatilization with uh, nitrogen fertilizer use 
and its cooling effect is much smaller than the nitrous oxide. Much smaller. Thank you. Um, I have one question that was sent in. Um, it's about the um, prior to this, and they asked that um, farmers have to adapt at a very local level, and climate information is usually available at a very national or maybe state level. How, how do we then, how do farmers hedge their bets based on information that is at a scale that they can't conceptually understand the relation to? So how do farmers hedge their bets and decide what adaptation measures they should take? Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good question. And, and we're really, you know, not entirely capable of providing that information. So farmers will tell us, um, you know, uh, okay, I get it that the climate is changing globally, that this is going to be affecting our uh, a local uh, uh, farming system, that maybe as we go through the next several decades, I may eventually have to make some kind of investments. But what I want to know is, is this season going to be wetter or drier? And like I was saying, there's a lot of unpredictability. It's not just that it's a little warmer every year, but there seems to be a lot of unusual, uh, unpredictable, variable weather. And we have a, a, a terrible time predicting um, in this, uh, my climate scientist colleague calls it the 10-day uh, to 10-year framework. We can, zero to 10 days, we have good forecasts. Uh, 10 to 100 years out, uh, we've got forecasts. But you know, this year or two years, three years down the road, these kind of seasonal or the next in the near term, we have the weakest, least certainty in our climate forecast. One thing um, we're doing is looking at indicators of uh, seasonal weather in different parts of the world. So in some parts of the world, for example, uh, down in the southeastern US, their, very, their, their seasonal weather is very, it's pretty sensitive to whether it's an El Nino year or a La Nina year or a neutral year. This has to do with, uh, you've probably heard some of this, that, that those phrases before, it has to do with some cycles that are kind of happen with or without climate change but they know that um, they can actually tell farmers in different parts of Florida and Georgia, et cetera, if it's an El Nino year and where you live, it's going to mean the probability of, let's say, a wetter spring is possible in a hotter office. But where you live, an El Nino year is going to mean something different. Um, in other parts of the world, like the Northeast, we don't have well-defined indicators like El Nino. We're not that sensitive to El Nino. So we're doing data analytics where we're looking at historical weather records that go back 50 to 100 years and just looking for correlations. And it could be that um, when it's a uh, cold and snowy, uh, uh, really super snowy uh, winter in Buffalo, it means it's going to be no snow in Ithaca. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. no, but these things, are, and it could be just kind of black box correlations like that. So it could be that if, um, if we find that uh, December temperatures in Toronto are such and such, then uh, spring temperatures in Buffalo might be. So looking for these kind of things. The other thing is kind of modeling from the ground up and using um, kind of just regional kind of models. But this is going to take us a few years to get the better forecast. So in the meantime, it's diversified, as I mentioned. Simply farmers hedging their bets. And the problem with that is if it's a really good year, they've got maybe less planted in their most profitable crop because they've had these other crops out there counting on some, you know, as in case it's a stressful year, but they may not yield as much in a good year. So. Yes, right. All right, Linda I'm curious about whether cultural issues um, play a big role in it. I think about no-till architecture, or um, no-tillage, you know, in terms of plowing and stuff, which is not going to be people used to doing. Yeah. Um, so how, but it makes a lot of sense in water retention and all right, that right. stuff. So how are you dealing with farmers about yeah, the thing is cultural issues and adoption of new practices, uh, this, you know, the getting over sort of uh, traditional approaches and people kind of breaking out of their cultural groups sometimes. And I, I will tell you this, that there, the literature on the effect of the cultural group you're in and your reaction to climate change is getting almost as big as the literature on climate change per se. You're, you're not alone in wondering about that, and there's a lot of behavioral scientists looking at this, uh, psychologists, sociologists looking at it. And indeed, the, uh, the cultural groups you belong to can definitely uh, either constrain or enhance your capacity to adapt. Because if you're, if you're in a cultural group where everybody's quickly you know, seeing something on the horizon and making changes quickly, uh, and they all have um, you know, similar uh, 
financial capacity, et cetera, but those that are really in the right cultural group whose you know, world will adapt more quickly. It's not always about, there, there's areas where they found farmers with plenty of money to adapt were not adapting. And it's simply because they're in a cultural group where they're not talking about that, that issue. Um, and so, but I do think that, you know, the farmers I know are, they're, they're really pretty much focused like a laser beam on the bottom line. And when they start seeing things impacting their bottom line, they're smart business people. And so they can, they can start making some shifts, even if it means typically going out of the cultural group uh, that belong to. And it's also a lot about the delivery of the information. So if you go up to some groups and you uh, make it seem you have to join a whole kind of cultural group that's, you know, Al Gore is your leader, or there's an anti-capitalist movement in a foot, you know, you're not going to get them to adopt. So, so it's a matter of also framing the issues uh, for different audiences. and then move to the reception. Um, and you're welcome to join us at the reception and ask other questions. Uh, Ryan, do you want to ask yours? Uh, sure. Well, thank you for playing us. It's uh, great and also horrifying. Um, <laughs> three questions for you. This is a, it's kind of a big picture question. Uh, what advice would you give to someone a millennial about the ages of 20 right now, let's say, generation 20? Um, they were a farmer, wanted to start farming. Mm -hmm. What would you tell them based on all your data and information of what you're seeing? Um, I'd say it's, I mean, actually, we see a lot of young people like Cornell and elsewhere really excited about farming. And um, it's, uh, it's not about getting rich, which is probably <laughs> good. But it's actually about uh, thinking about the environment and thinking that there's a better way to produce our food. And I also think, uh, maybe I'm crazy, but I think it's like the Food Network has something to do with it. I mean, a lot of young people we know are really foodies and really care much more than my generation did about where their food comes from and cooking and all of that. Um, so I think there's a lot of enthusiasm about that. Um, and so are you asking what would I, uh, I would recommend, uh, don't, don't hesitate and try getting in. The one thing is to be very cautious about is that it's, uh, uh, the, the capital it takes to build a farm, to really live the kind of life where you could have uh, you know, some kids that you're going to be sending off to college, have a nice you know, funds for a vacation. It takes, uh, in farming today, uh, you have to work very cleverly at finding special market niches that you can accomplish that without big capital investment, or you have to think about uh, capital investment. Big equipment and all that, so that's a real constraint to um, uh, getting new people into the farming system. In the face of these challenges that we're seeing and we're talking about yeah. here, what, what advice would you give them uh, as they go into this kind of more turbulent, I would say, um, area? Uh, uh, we're going to need twice as much food as we have before, so there's going to be lots of room for farmers to produce food. So if you really want to be part of that, you can be part of it, because there's going to be a huge demand for food. The demand for food is going to double. So I think that there's opportunities there, but obviously it's, you've got to be, what we say, climate smart. So I think, um, you know, learning, uh, uh, and I think, you know, the younger generation is more uh, immediately acceptable of the climate change phenomenon, more likely to be able to search the web and find out information about what, what might be uh, down the pike in terms of future climate where they are, better able to use web resources, etc. cetera. So, uh, but you've got to think about farming. Um, you know, this is the first generation of farmers that you know, can't rely on historical weather records to tell them what to plant, when to plant it, or how to grow it. But I think if you go into farming knowing that, and you're using real-time weather data and climate forecasts, and um, if you're smart about it. There are some, you know, incubator system, uh, farm incubator programs uh, popping up here and there where farmers can get some experiencing, get, get some experience without having to make the capital investments, make sure it's really what they want to do, and, uh, and getting some experience so they might be better able to get loans that they might need um, to get in farming. But uh, a big thing to be careful about is not getting too far in debt, that even if you're the best farmer in the world, you can't get out of debt. So you can't take on too much debt too fast. Uh, very farmers, it's, maybe, maybe, 